Wonderful. Oh, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. Feel free to uh, name yourselves. Let me know where you guys are coming from today. You guys from Sonoma County, around there, California. Are you even in the United States today? Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us chat box. I'm sure we're all pretty acquainted with Zoom at this point, but if you just move your cursor down to the bottom chat box, right? All right, it's to the left of the green uh, share button if you see it there and just click on it and let us know where you are tuning in from today. Great. Matthew Sikanese, what's up brother? Nagio creative photographer, look him up. He's great. <laughs> hey, my brother Matthew, also from San Diego. San Diego. Uh oh, uh -oh. let's see. Is this joint order not all working? Hmm. Thank you, Sheila, for the information. Thank you, Matthew. Interesting. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Matthew Harris from San Diego. I was there for five and a half years. Loved it there. Loved San Diego. The more, uh, the more my brother shows me pictures of San Diego where he just moved to, the more I'm like... My move there. That's good. That's good. Beaches are nice. Beaches are nice. I will say that. <laughs> Sorry for the hold up, everybody. We'll get started yeah. in just a minute here. Thank you for joining. Just waiting for a few more people to trickle on in. And oh, right on. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> it started at 6 so five, I see. Perfect. Jules, great to see you. Sheila. Sheila. In the flesh. Pat, great to see you. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. So plenty of photographers, I'm guessing, in, in this webinar today. Yeah, Jules. Uh, Jules is doing great stuff. Uh, he's working out of San Diego, too. Oh, my. Uh, started getting into some underwater photography. If you guys want to check him out, Jules is dope. Again, Matthew Sicanese in the house. Uh, just a fantastic creative photographer. He's uh, part deaf and part blind, which makes for some really interesting uh, concepts and how he does his photography. Uh, so definitely check him out. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Good. Good to hear that. Love that. Love to make wonderful, Matthew. We'll look into that. Uh, thank you for letting me know, Sheila, that the new link is working for everybody now. Good to go. Uh, hopefully we get a few more coming in a little bit. Kung Fu, those technical difficulties. Yeah, getting right past them. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think ready to roll yeah i think it's time game time all right welcome everyone uh my name is carlos 
and I am the environmental educator at the, San, uh, the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation. And today, I hope you guys can see my screen all right over here. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming in and joining us for this webinar, uh, Connecting with Wildlife, brought to you by the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation and photographer Joshua Asel, which we have here today with us. We invite you to say hello in the chat box. And like I said, tell us where you're coming from today. Um, and I'd like to begin this place-based celebration with the land acknowledgement. Oh, pardon me, I don't... But we'll begin with uh, some information about the Laguna Foundation today. The Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa, California, that works to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The Laguna is a 22 mile long wetland complex with a 254 square mile watershed that encompasses businesses, infrastructure, farmland, open space, and people living in Sonoma County communities here, uh, whether it's Santa Rosa, Cotati, Runner Park, and parts of Sebastopol and Windsor. And the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands have been heavily impacted over time by development uh, within its watershed and across the Santa Rosa Plain now faces important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and educational work today. Despite the challenges, Laguna is a biodiversity gem with interconnected plant communities that support hundreds of, of residents and migratory animals along with endangered plants and animals. As a very special designation of being a wetland of international importance, which is one of only 34 sites here in the United States that has this honor. We can serve and restore these special wetlands by planting native trees, shrubs, grasses, and flowers, managing invasive species, and collaborating with our agency and nonprofit partners to improve the overall health of the Laguna. We increase public knowledge and appreciation of the Laguna through our Learning Laguna Elementary School programs, Camp Tule Summer Camp, and community programs like this webinar today. Thank you to those of you that included a donation with the registration for this program. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Our organizations rely on donations from individuals like you to continue our critical restoration, conservation, and education work. You can also donate securely on the Laguna Foundation website, and I will include links to both of those pages in the chat and in the follow-up email. This presentation is being recorded and will be available to view on our YouTube channel by the end of next week. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box. I will monitor the chat throughout the talk and pose your questions to our presenter at the end. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, we have our award-winning wildlife conservation photographer, Joshua Asel. I've had the pleasure of seeing Joshua's art up close and I've been able to hear some great stories from him. I'm excited for him to share more with us today. With that, the floor is yours, Joshua. Thank you. Awesome. What's up, everybody? So great to have you here. Um, I'm just going to press share screen here, get the PowerPoint presentation going. Boom. Yes, indeed. Connecting with wildlife. Um, so, yeah, uh, really looking forward to be able to tell you guys some great stories. Uh, we're definitely going to be exploring California condors, wildlife vehicle conflicts, coexistence with predators, life of a conservation photographer, and what it takes. Uh, and then, you know, the bonus, Sea Shepherd. Uh, sea Shepherd, I'm really happy they let me release some images, just wildlife and landscapes only. Uh, so I'm, I won't be able to show you uh, poachers or the ship activities or anything, but we're going to see some some nice landscapes and wildlife from my time with Sea Shepherd recently. Um, right, so let's get into it. Of course, what you're looking at right now is the California Condor, which is what I've been spending a lot of my time photographing recently. Um, I absolutely love them. And you can see why. So that's the first part we're talking about today is observing California condors among the rarest animals on earth. And they really are. Uh, they are North America's largest bird. They have nearly 10 foot wingspans, you know, absolutely massive. Um, and uh, they've recently come back from uh, uh, just a couple decades ago when they were actually extinct in the wild. Um, and uh, just actually one quick thing before I get into this, 
is I just want to let you know that uh, there are going to be some images that might be just a little bit disturbing, um, such as the animals hit by cars or condors eating off of um, a cow carcass. But what I really want to let you know is, you know, even though some of these images can be sad, um, you know, that's part of the reason why I do this is, you know, I really want to help the problems of the world and find those solutions and at least highlight the solutions that, you know, biologists and researchers are coming up with. So there's always hope, you know, no matter what, you know, kinds of bad things are happening, there's always hope for the most part. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to being able to, you know, show you some um, awesome new brand new imagery such as this one right here. Um, and um, yeah, so that's about it. So let's get on with the presentation. Um, so this image and some of the images you're going to be seeing are from uh, my recent, most recent assignment with Whalebone Magazine, uh, who is my, my new favorite magazine right now. They are really cool. Um, and uh, I was able to spend some time with this condor, uh, you know, first thing in the morning. Um, which uh, <laughs> there, there's a little bit more going into it than just walking up and photographing this condor. So we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, but before I photographed condors in Pinnacles National Park, I started in Big Sur about seven years ago. Um, and what you're looking at are the first images I ever made of condors. And it was just a really crazy time because I wanted to work with Ventana Wildlife Society and the Condor Recovery Program, uh, which are uh, National Park Service representative, representatives out of Pinnacles National Park. And um, thankfully they, they let me come on this insane uh, journey with them. Uh, in Big Sur. And basically, you know, I go to meet them uh, first thing in the morning and <laughs> they drive, we drive up an hour and a half from Big Sur into the Santa Lucia mountains. Um, and uh, they have a secret research site there for California condors. And I had never even seen a California condor before, you know, and, you know, we get to the top and I look and there are about 40 of one of the rarest animals on earth just right smack in front of me out in front of me and i'm just blown away you know it's such an incredible thing to see these absolutely gargantuan birds uh you know up close and personal and the reason everybody was coming together uh is because uh, it was a uh, actually if you look at the picture on the left there where she uh, has a blood sample there um, it was to um, grab blood samples uh, from California condors to check for lead poisoning because that is their that is what sent them uh, into extinction in the first place um, extinction in the wild that is and so uh, not only are they testing for blood poisoning but they are checking uh, their tags that are on their wings uh, they have um, uh, little electronic transmitters with GPS on them. And they, the biologists are able to tell where they're going um, and, uh, you know, kind of what they're doing and if they're alive or not. Um, so you can actually see one of the transmitters uh, and tags on the right wing there. Uh, that's kind of flopping off. Um, and uh, so they are really significant. And each one of these tags has a number and color that corresponds to their age, uh, where they were hatched, um, and, um, and how many of, of them are there uh, between different years of being hatched, right? So this is a juvenile California condor, really pretty different from the adults you see because they don't have those sunset color heads yet, just kind of these black heads. Um, and at the research site, it's pretty funny because they uh, they are so used to being handled, um, and they are um, excuse me. So they're very used to being handled, and they are interested in watching each other get handled. Um, so just going to touch on a few points here. Yeah, almost went extinct mainly due to lead poisoning. There were other factors uh, like pesticides, DDT, DDE, 
Um, you know, the same pesticides that almost sent bald eagles and peregrine falcons into extinction. Uh, and yeah, in 1987, the last two California condors were taken from the wild to try to reproduce the species. Uh, and they were reproducing the condors uh, in the Oakland Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, um, and the Los Angeles Zoo. And so a couple decades later, you know, over two decades later, California condors could indeed be seen flying again uh, in central California. It was the first place they got released. Um, and they've been doing pretty well since. Uh, there are, I think, a little over 300 in the wild. But really, that there's such a small, small population. They are still very, you know, critically endangered. Um, and uh, it's going to take still a lot of effort to bring them back. But, you know, it's uh, it's one of the biggest conservation success stories in the world, you know, bringing back this literally prehistoric bird, um, you know, back into existence. And uh, it is just awesome to see them up close. And so you can tell, you know, this one is very comfortable being handled by a biologist. He's very chill, hanging out. Uh, and, and on this day, uh, at least at this time, it was a record-breaking day for uh, capturing and blood testing condors with uh, 14 of them being captured and blood tested. And they are incredibly intelligent. I mean, you look them in the eyes and you can tell that they each have their own individual individuality. You know, they're so beautiful and brilliant and, uh, and just a really unique intelligence. And so part of the way that the biologists are able to bring them in is by providing these cow carcasses. And what they do uh, essentially is uh, not just only to, they're not there just to get them blood tested, but also to provide supplemental food. If they can't find enough food, um, say on the coastline, because, you know, just like all vultures, they act as the cleanup crew. And for a long time, people thought that California condors were, you know, these giant death bringers that attack people, which literally never happens, not ever once, you know, they, they are uh, exclusively eating carrion, you know, dead carcasses. So it's really important to have them in our environment. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think they look ugly, but uh, I'm really partial to these birds, you know. Uh, I just think they are so beautiful in their own way. Uh, yeah, so a few years later, I, I started checking out Pinnacles National Park. Um, and Pinnacles is my go-to right now. It's the newest national park in California. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, even though it's smaller, uh, it is have becoming uh, just insanely popular. You know, I used to be able to go in and grab my favorite campsite whenever I wanted. And I tried to go there uh, last week um, for the, uh, the article I was working on. And, you know, my favorite campsite was booked out three months in advance. So this place is exploding in popularity. And people are dying to try to see these California condors up close. And, you know, and for one, being one of the world's rarest animals, uh, you know, it, it's such a um, beautiful opportunity to try to actually go see uh, a, a megafauna species. Uh, and you can see why I spend some, uh, you know, as much time here as I can. It's just so beautiful. This is at sunset, and this is one condor, you know, in, in on top of its roof. And you know, if you were at my gallery recently, um, you know, this is one of the prints that's there. And they just have these gigantic, um, you know, spires uh, at the top of Pinnacles National Park, um, and they're also covered in these you know, different colored neon lichens is, is pretty incredible. And, you know, condors, California condors are, to me, as amazing as the places they choose to spend their lives, you know, in Big Sur, in um, Pinnacles National Park, you know, if you're going beyond that in, you know, the Grand Canyon, uh, they really know how to choose a really good looking home. And so these are some of the, the images that I recently brought back for me, just some awesome close-ups of uh, a brand new couple. And so the biologists have been seeing this couple, uh, you know, uh, procreating 
uh, quite a bit recently. Um, and of course, you can also see their tags, uh, green 47 and pink zero. So that's 747 and 800. Those are their names. And you can see the transmitters on their tags as well. And uh, they are very, you know, they're very friendly with each other. Um, and it's just such an honor to be able to uh, be able to photograph these incredible animals. Um, so in order to actually get images of them, you know, I, since I couldn't get a campsite, I'm leaving at 3.30 in the morning from San Jose, California, driving an hour and a half uh, and basically starting to head up, uh, hike up at uh, 5.20 in the morning when it's nice and, and pitch black still. And I really want to get there first thing at, su at uh, sunrise. Uh, because that's when they're still in their roost. Um, I know where the condor roost is, um, and that's when they're still in their roost. And uh, it is just a, a really magical place, and the condors love soaking up the sun first thing in the morning. I also wanted to give Pinnacles National Park... Um, oh, hold on just a second. You hearing some condors right now? I hope everybody can hear that. I uh, can't hear it. You can't hear that? No, I can't oh. hear it. Sorry, Joshua. That's okay. <laughs> Everybody's just listening to silence right now. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Thought you might be able to hear that. Um, so I, I turned my attention to Pinnacles National Park as well because there was a lot less attention uh, for the condors at Pinnacles. You know, everybody is so focused on Big Sur. But, you know, you get to the top and you just have these gorgeous views. Um, these are some of the spires that have been uh, forced upwards uh, by, um, excuse me, the, uh, the fault line. It's pretty much lying directly on the fault line. And uh, it's just such an incredible place. Like at nighttime, the trails start to turn pink. Uh, just a really beautiful area. And this is my first attempt at what's called chrono photography. So basically uh, taking a whole bunch of images in a row um, and stitching them together. And so basically what I'm showing you is the exact flight path of one of the condors that's heading into the roost um, uh, as sunset is coming. And also I need to mention that uh, I was, um, very happy to be helped by this uh, National Geographic photographer, Zabi Boo, who was my inspiration for this and uh, was really very nice in helping me uh, learn this new photography skill. All right, moving on to wildlife vehicle conflicts. Um, so this I spent two years uh, of my life uh, photographing um, and it is really, uh, it's going to be a little bit more intense to look at. Um, and I um, worked in collaboration with the UC Davis Road Ecology Project for this. Uh, I noticed that, you know, they're doing some great work and I also wanted to provide some really nice imagery for them. Um, and this is a long, -tail we long tailed weasel uh, who was struck by a car. And, you know, it, it's kind of crazy because California, you know, where I live, doesn't have a lot of wildlife corridors. There's there's only two uh, wildlife underpasses. Uh, actually, I think there might be a third one now uh, in um, Santa Cruz and really not providing a lot of opportunity for wildlife to safely cross roads. And we'll get in a, a bit more into that about why they want to cross roads and, you know, what their their purposes are. Um, so yes, I worked with UC Davis on this, um, and yeah, just in North America, or excuse me, in the U.S., um, 500 animals are killed every year, um, and you know that's as many as uh, perished in the Australian fires that happened semi recently. So this is you know this is happening every year, and I, we we have the solution. We just need to implement it better. And I wanted to photograph these animals in a way that, you know, draws attention, but isn't too gruesome. And it's so important to, to, you know, make it 
at least palatable um, for other photographers. Um, so, you know, why do they use these roadways? You know, it's a great question. Looking at this, you know, this is what I call the impossible gauntlet. This is uh, right before or right after, um, excuse me, the Golden Gate Bridge. And a lot of animals tried to cross here. And as you can see, taking from this, I think three second exposure, you know, it's a nightmare for animals that are trying to cross. And there, there's, there's no way to actually survive this um, as far as I've seen, unless, you know, they're really lucky in the middle of the night or something. Um, so why are they crossing? So appearance of convenience. Uh, wildlife, just like we do, they like taking the, the, the path of least resistance. You know, they're trying to conserve energy and they want to, uh, you know, they want to survive as long as possible, which means, you know, using these e what are seemingly easy pathways. So prey availability, lack thereof. So basically what, what humans have done is, is with these roadways is break up nature into islands of nature. So um, if there's not enough prey or even mates in one area, they are forced to move into a different area. And that's why a lot of animals are uh, crossing these roadways, just lack of prey, lack of, um, of uh, mate choices. Um, and also something I touched on before, no wildlife corridors. So again, they are just forced into this situation. Um, but, you know, there's definitely hope. Uh, you know, a lot of states are already implementing, a lot of other states besides California are already implementing wildlife corridors. Um, and, you know, California is really getting on top of that, uh, thankfully. Uh, this is a skunk where I basically tried to photograph it, uh, its spirit leaving its body, um, which I used a really um, uh, interesting lighting technique, as you can see, to try to convey this, uh, because, you know, I don't, I don't like to think that these are kind of soulless beings. I really uh, would like them to move on, you know, as 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 best as possible. Um, and so I really wanted to convey like the soul leaving the body. Um, and of course, you know, it's not just the animals that get hit that are affected. Uh, they do the the adults that are hit that that have uh, kits or kittens, you know they do leave behind orphans. And so this is an orphan at the, the snow, or excuse me, the Silicon Valley Wildlife Rescue Center, uh, who takes in more uh, animals uh, hit by vehicles than anywhere in California, um, you know, and their orphans. And so this is a tiny bobcat. It's, it's maybe a foot long. And, uh, you know, it, it, its mother was hit by a car. And it's the same for this juvenile coyote, it's, you know, its parents were hit by cars and it also has a sibling. And so they ended up, uh, thankfully, in Silicon Valley Wildlife Rescue. Uh, so what you're looking at here is uh, the newest, biggest wildlife corridor that will ever be created. And it's going over Highway 101 in Los Angeles. And a big reason this is happening is because uh, there is a local population of mountain lions that is uh, rapidly going extinct because they are not able to find mates or prey. And there are so few of them left. Um, so not only is this going to provide just awesome corridor, uh, you know, for these, for this wildlife, but it's really going to refresh the entire area. Um, the entire corridor is going to be, is going to be made of, you know, um, basically riparian habitat, you know, local um, bushes and flora and all that good stuff. And it feeds directly back into uh, the Sierra Madre mountain range. So this is gonna be really significant. They did get their funding, you know, millions and millions of dollars um, and, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people have been advocating for this to happen, you know, even, you know, famous actors, um, which I, I can't even think of any names right now, but it's just been such a monumental, um, you know, thing that's happening. And, and I'm so thankful that 
these kinds of wildlife corridors are possible, uh, you know, because of organizations that, you know, want to do better and they want to link up everything. And, and so hopefully this is going to provide a much more, um, uh, well, it's going to provide crucial uh, linkages for, for mates for mountain lions. That, that is kind of the main draw. Um, and kind of moving into that, coexisting with large carnivores. So chat, I want to hear from you right now. What are the first, I know we're looking at mountain lions, but is that the first thing that you think of uh, when you're thinking about large carnivores, like coexisting with large carnivores? Is anybody, uh, Carlos, is anybody um, entering anything? Yeah, uh, Jules said urban bears. I said black bears. Urban bears. Yeah, uh, Sheila said she thinks of lions. Ian Nelson said bobcats. And bobcats, yeah, absolutely, definitely. Um, Around here, for sure, uh, there are bears, there are bo are bobcats, um, but a lot for for a lot of people, mountain lions is just biggest, you know, kind of number one thing that they're worried about. There's there's uh, a good handful of them, you know, kind of if there's an, enough wildlife um, or I should say natural ecosystem, they're definitely going to be around. And so I spent quite a bit of my life tracking and working with mountain lions and educating people about coexisting with mountain lions and large carnivores. This was the first image I ever got on a trail cam uh, when I was working with Fleet Day Conservation Fund. Um, although, you know, I don't work with them anymore. Um, and this is the only image I'm allowed to show of, of the mountain lions I have uh, camera trapped um, throughout my three years of working with Lead Conservation Fund. And, you know, this is in Napa Valley, which isn't too far away. And, you know, they can be right in your backyards and, uh, you know, you don't even know it. And so many people are scared of large carnivores, especially mountain lions. You know, there's a big fear that you know, one day somebody, you're going to get attacked by a mountain lion, but I'm really here to, to tell you and reassure you that that's probably not going to happen. Only three people a year on average uh, in all of North America are attacked and, and hardly anybody dies, you know, and these are usually from inexperienced juveniles, you know, their prey base is so different from how they see humans. Um, and it's so important to realize that they are so much more scared of us than we are of them. I mean, I've been inside um, a, a uh, alpha male mountain lion's den, you know, with him, uh, and he still, you know, didn't do anything. And it's not like I advise people to just go inside dens with mountain lions. Um, it, it's because I've worked with them for actually quite a bit of time and, and spent time with them. So uh, you know, my, my time working with, this is Kuma, the mountain lion. And what I'm doing is training him to come up against the fence. And this is actually a health for a health check with UC Davis. So what I'm, I'm trying to do is actually get him to push his entire hind quarter up against the fence. And what we would do then is actually stick him with a needle uh, and kind of let him pass out so we could do a health check on him or they would do a health check on him. And uh, he, he really liked uh, fish. He wouldn't do, he wouldn't train for anything other than fish. Um, and so my experience with mountain lions has led me to have some incredible encounters. I've encountered them, I think about 12 times, uh, maybe 13. I can't, um, but it, you know, in, in none of those instances had I ever felt threatened. You know, and I, it really goes to show that they really want nothing to do with us. Uh, of course, he's not my friend. You know, every animal, especially one of this size, has their boundaries. And that's something that uh, we really need to focus on is, you know, not crowding these animals, not trying to take selfies with them, not, you know, trying, not intentionally having them get used to humans because, you know, it's especially 
uh, relevant with with black bears, uh, maybe some grizzly bears, but I know for black with black bears for sure that the more they get used to people, the more and just comfortable with people, the the bigger the risk there is for to actually be harmed by one of these magnificent predators. Um, you know it. So, you know, if you see one of these in the wild, be sure to give it its space, you know, and if it's not threatening you, I always try to tell people just to enjoy the experience. Um, you know, the last time I saw one was uh, where actually one of our participants works, um, Sheila, uh, she works in uh, Mount Annabelle. I'm not sure if you work there anymore, but I saw a mountain lion try and hunt a deer and failed. It happened right in front of me. And, you know, the mountain lion took one look at me and just walked off, you know. So <clears throat> these these animals really want nothing to do with us. And if you do see one in the wild um, and it's not threatening you, then really try to enjoy it because it is such a rare treat. Of course, uh, you know, educating people means inspiring the next generation of, you know, trackers. Um, and biologists. And so what we have here is one experienced biologist teaching, you know, the next generation, and they're using um, uh, some radio telemetry to find, um, to practice finding uh, the GPS collar of a mountain lion. It also involves uh, educating kids in schools, you know, it's so important to, to reach out to the youth, uh, you know, whether it's uh, in, in these privately funded schools or in inner city schools. Uh, and the kids are just ridiculous and, and fun to be with and teaching them that, you know, mountain lions are, um, and large carnivores are really to be appreciated as part of the natural ecosystem that is responsible for keeping us alive. Right. So I just want to, <laughs> get through this kind of quickly um, because you're going to see be seeing mostly um, <clears throat> images of uh, well selfies uh, and uh, just talking a bit about you know kind of what it takes to be a conservation photographer because you know people think National Geographic and you get to travel all the time but indeed the title is you know injuries sickness and great views um, so <clears throat> these are some older images for sure of uh, when I was sent to the high Andes uh, to track mountain lions and uh, small cats like the Pampas cat and the Andean mountain cat, uh, all of which are threatened um, or except for the mountain lion uh, threatened or critically endangered. And the image on the left is from when I first started and you're, you know, you're hiking in and, and bringing in donkeys to the to the campsite full of gear, um, and, but really what you're what I'm experiencing uh, before getting to all the the good parts of it are you know freezing cold temperatures, um, uh, you know really harsh nights, incredibly harsh environments, uh, not knowing the language of where I'm going. So it's really relieving when you have uh, you know you meet up with a team member who knows the language and can and can um, show you around and lots of preparation that goes into these types of trips. And on, on the main image on the right is me using radio telemetry to, to find the GPS collar of the endangered Indian cat, which it's kind of hard to see, but it is in my hand there. Um, and that was a little bit, a little bit later. Uh, but uh, unfortunately this entire trip, you know, was a failure for me because uh, I basically had a tooth. I was at such a high elevation. Our, our, our campsite was at uh, 14,400 feet. Um, and we were at such a high elevation that it just so happened that one of my uh, teeth basically exploded inside uh, of my mouth. And, and uh, well, obviously, but it exploded. And I had to come back and, you know, get surgery and all that stuff. So, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that that <laughs> don't get talked about too much. You know, and this again, this is in Argentina. We're trying to get there. You know, we're, we're making the journey. Uh, and I mean, I remember one of the first things that 
was said to me when I got to Argentina, and thankfully I'm with um, one of my teammates at the time is, you know, well, okay. So I asked him if I could photograph the police because I see two police on one motorcycle and they're carrying, you know, M16s. And they're like, no, you absolutely cannot, you know, photograph them because I wanted to photograph them. You absolutely cannot photograph them because if you do, they're going to arrest both of us, put us in jail, you know, maybe kill us uh, and definitely take all your stuff. So, you know, really, really bad idea to photograph them. And, uh, you know, we get, we get going, we're traveling a few days later and we hit this gigantic protest. And basically the native, the natives were there were protesting that um, from what I remember is that their land was stolen and they want it back. And this goes on for hours. And so I uh, kind of daringly like try to snap an image and immediately eyes on me. You can see, you know, this woman here looking at me, this guy's pointing at me, another one of the police is pointing at me, this guy's, you know, this is not supposed to happen immediately. You know, I put my camera down and I don't want the attention anymore because I don't want to go to jail at the very least and have all my stuff stolen. So, you know, I would have rather, th this is the kind of stuff that goes on, you know, um, there's, you know, issues with, poaching and corrupt police and racism you know at, at certain checkpoints uh i'm being told that it's uh, it's a good thing i'm not dark skin uh because you know then there would be problems you know and my team leader tells me you know shut up don't say anything don't look at them just you know let me handle everything so there are definitely you know dangers that go along with conservation photography wildlife or cultural uh, but of course, what alleviates, you know, those types of moments are getting to, you know, spend time with a random group of strangers that, you know, take interest in your work. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I love photographing the monarch butterflies when they come to Pacific Grove. And all of a sudden, you know, I have a crowd, they're asking questions, they want to see, you know, the photography that's going on. Uh, and it's those moments that I really, really appreciate, you know, being able to spend time uh, with people. It's also about just building relationships overall. I mean, it's so incredibly important to, to build those relationships. Um, and, you know, with my partner at Lighthawk, and this is Bill. Bill is the man, uh, you know, and he uh, flew me over uh, Big Sur, Monterey recently to photograph uh, great white sharks um, for a project I was involved in. And, you know, you learn to you learn to maintain really good relationships. Um, uh, you also learn how to, how to burn bridges or prevent burning bridges, you know, which was uh, something I was good at, at, you know, in the, in the beginning of being a conservation photographer. Um, you, you know, it's so interesting to think about, I just want to save wildlife. I just want to help, you know, it, anything that I'm really passionate about, but it becomes very political. You know, there's, there's people that, okay, I want to help, let's say, I want to help this species. Okay, but I want to do it this way. No, I want to do it this way. No, I want to do it this way. And so it, it becomes a kind of almost race to, to see who could do it, you know, the best way. Um, and, and, you know, what is really the best way of going about that, um, which was something I was really kind of taken aback by, because I'm not really huge into politics, but all of a sudden you're, you're playing into the hand of politics. And, um, learning not to build, burn those bridges and maintain really good relationships, whether, whether it's with, uh, you know, my sponsor Nikon uh, USA or Lighthawk Conservation Flying um, or, um, uh, you know, rescue centers that I, that I try to partner with. Um, it, it's so important to main, re, maintain relationships, especially like with my editors, um, you know, that, I really hope they put my images in magazines. So maintaining relationships is incredibly important. Uh, there's another part of it. It's a lot of office work, you know, uh, it's kind of going brain dead here. Um, it's about 90 for 95% uh, office work for me. Uh, it's not just uh, going to, you know, magical places all the time, but, you know, maintaining those relationships, doing the research, uh, understand understanding what biologists are going through to to 
you know, in, in some cases for decades and, and decades um, to revive a species, it all plays into a part of that. And uh, so, you know, um, it's, it's different for me than it is for say, you know, Brian Scary or Paul Nicklin or um, uh, Amy Vitale you know, or Christina Mittermeier, these, you know, massive conservation photographers, wildlife photographers who have the privilege of, of traveling all the time. You know, I want to get to where they are someday, um, uh, but right now it is just incredible amounts of office time with, uh, you know, lots of coffee and, uh, you know, burning my brain out every once in a while. And then it's also about the, you know, the family and the friends. And I would not be in the position that I am today without my family and my friends. And it's so, um, it's so important that they understand it's so important for me that they understand what I'm going through, but I also want to teach them about ecosystems and natural, you know, the wildlife and, and uh, why they're so important, how they sustain our entire existence, how they, uh, you know, how our ancestors, you know, worked off the land and relied on the, on the natural land for us to be here all, today. It's all thanks to wildlife and natural ecosystems. So it's so important that, that, I try to get everybody involved that I can, my family, my friends and people that I don't know. And, you know, it's like I always say that I think everybody, literally every single person is a fan of nature. They just don't know it yet. They don't know what their favorite species is. They don't know what their favorite places are. And and if we can show them these incredible experiences uh, by bringing them into really unique and incredible environments, not just maybe your local park, but like national parks, and showing them the, the magnificence of, you know, incredible species, then uh, I think we really have a shot at, at, you know, creating a better world for, for you know, better, better world for everybody, but for our legacies and, and what that means to, um, what that means to each individual person can be very different, but it, I think it's so important. So this was my most recent last big um, assignment that I had with Sea Shepherd. And I'm very thankful because the International League of Conservation Photographers um, uh, gave me this opportunity to spend with Sea Shepherd, Shepherd, excuse me, um, and o Operation Milagro 8 survey of the last Vaquitas um, was was something I feel very privileged to be on is definitely one of the more challenging experiences of my life because, you know, you're spending time on a vessel that's absolutely packed. You have no private space. You know, your sleeping quarters are, they barely fit you, you know, um, but the, the worth and the value and the privilege of being able to uh, work with some incredible biologists, uh, you know, see incredible wildlife uh, and really, help on a mission that uh, is going to determine the, the fate of an entire species uh, is, is really, you know, I, I just feel honored and humbled and, and it's such, such an incredible thing to do. So, um, you know, what I'm going to be able to show you again are just the, the wildlife uh, and the landscapes. Um, and uh, yeah, let's get cracking. So we were on a boat for a month um, and thankfully our captain, you know, allowed us to come on one of these desert islands that's scattered into the Sea of Cortez um, or you might know as, as the Gulf of California. And in, in the Gulf of California, there are just tons of these little desert islands. Um, and uh, these, these mountains here actually are much bigger than they appear in the picture. And it has some insane unique uh, flora and fauna. And uh, so they let me basically roam this, uh, this island mountain for, for a few hours to try and get some images. And uh, basically what you have here is, I'm not sure what the, the name of this plant was. I, I had a very hard time finding the name of this plant. I could not find it actually, uh, but it's basically a cactus bush. Um, and on the end of it, are these flowers and 
I was able to find this Costa's hummingbird after hiking up this mountain for, you know, two hours. It's one of the only, you know, specks of wildlife I could find is this Costa's hummingbird. I'm so thankful that it, it just kind of appeared right in front of me. And uh, pretty similar to the Anna's hummingbirds we have here in California, but just really beautiful uh, little hummingbird. And the landscape itself is uh, beautiful, but treacherous. Um, a lot like the high Andes in Argentina, where you just have crumbling rock. Um, and uh, that's basically what you're hiking up the whole time because there aren't trails here. You know, there's, it's, it's not anywhere that a lot of people spend time. It's just, you know, carve out your own path as, as well as you can and do it without getting injured if you can. And, um, and so this is the bay where we spent some of our time swimming and also seeing uh, whale sharks and uh, some really hunt, weird hunting activities from actual sharks um, that we were swimming in the water with, but you know, uh, we couldn't actually see and was very um, tense. You could say tense, yeah. <laughs> so you, I'm basically, I'm just turning up right from the image you just looked at. I turn right and you know, this is a big old hill with the crumbling rocks. And there's not a lot going on here. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, these really weird sparse um, uh, pieces of vegetation, but every once in a while, you see just a glimpse of life. And like it says, this is the desert island rock rend, and they make their homes inside of these rocks. Uh, and I saw a mated pair. I think this is the male. And the Desert Island rock run is, you know, it's, it's uncommon, but pretty hard to find. And I had to spend a couple hours uh, for them to actually get used to me just so I could get these images. And a lot of, you know, wildlife photography is just straight up, you know, being patient enough to have wildlife trust you even from a distance. And of course, I'm using uh, a telephoto lens, a nice big lens. So I'm not you know, freaking them out. I'm not getting too close. And I want to make sure that these animals feel comfortable with my presence. And on the backside, they just have some really cool little spots. Um, just a really beautiful bird and, and definitely something you don't necessarily see in the States. Uh, moving on to ocean life, of course. Um, so it looks like it's called the bride's whale. It's called, it's pronounced Brutus. Um, and this little glimpse was enough to get everybody just freaking stoked out of their minds because, you know, we are out there for days and days at a time looking for vaquita porpoises, you know, um, the most critically endangered marine mammal on earth. And they have the fin uh, the size of a football, you know, like half of a football. <laughs> and so we're looking at this gigantic ocean uh, off the coast of San Felipe. Um, and you know, you don't get to see a lot, you know, we're spending weeks looking out and then you see this Brutus whale, which uh, is either threatened or endangered or critically endangered, depending on the area. Not a lot of information about Brutus whales in the Gulf of California, but, you know, it's a really good sized whale. And all we got to see was this fin, uh, you know, and the biologists were freaking out. And it's, it's great to have those moments of alleviation in, in the middle of these uh, very long days where you're sitting on the water, uh, you know, filled by poachers, uh, kind of wondering what's going to happen and just, um, you know, your eyes are, are bloodshot because you've been looking, you know, out, out at these basically naked oceans for, uh, na naked ocean surfaces for so long. Uh, so again, yeah, great moment of alleviation. And of course that goes for here too. So, I mean, just totally awesome. This is, uh, obviously orcas. These are obviously orcas and this is a baby. Uh, that is in the middle of two mothers. Um, and it was a really interesting situation because this was the first time anybody had seen orcas uh, off the coast of San Felipe in um, six years. And I was so thankful to, to be there and capture them. But of course, this raises a really big concern. Uh, immediately, everybody is thinking, well, there's not a lot to eat there. What are they going to eat? Basically, the only thing, one of the only things they have to eat there are vaquita porpoises. And 
by the end of our survey, we found at most eight vaquitas in this protected zone, supposedly protected, you know, uh, covered in poachers. So, you know, between nets and the potential for orcas hunting uh, vaquita porpoises, of which there are eight of them left, uh, it, you know, obviously it's not looking great. Um, so it's amazing to see them, but it's also a potential problem for the vaquita porpoises. And, and we really hope that, you know, they are going to be around at least until next year. Um, and that we have the chance to, you know, keep educating the, the locals um, and, and have them using alternative uh, netting methods so that if animals get stuck in a net, they might be able to get out easier or that they might, excuse me, might not be able to get stuck in it at all. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's tough talking about this without actually showing the imagery, obviously, because I'm not allowed to, but, um, and I really wish I could, I could show you guys more, but, you know, suffice it, suffice it to say that biologists have spent millions and millions of dollars trying to get vaquita porpus, you know, back into a good place, which really hasn't been happening. Um, and it's, it's like the last push possible. And so, you know, I, I feel very, very um, privileged to have and, and lucky and, and blessed to just be able to be on the survey looking for vaquita porpoises. Um, and basically, I'm going to show you the next image is of a vaquita porpoise. Uh, but I don't want anybody to get too excited because it's an awful image. Uh, and it was seen in the distance um, at, a, at a great distance. Uh, but it might end up being the last image of a vaquita porpoise ever made. Um, so that tiny little thing in the ocean, which is, you know, two and a half feet long, three feet long, you know, this is what we're looking for. And this is about a half a mile off. And I was lucky to get this images, be, these images, because I'm looking, I'm, I'm listening to the biologists. They're saying, all right, it's, you know, it's two, it's, uh, it's six clicks out this way, you know, Northwest over here. And sometimes I see them, sometimes I don't, like me personally. And uh, with this one, you know, this image happened after we hadn't seen a vaquita for two weeks. Um, and it was the last hour of the last day of the survey. And I basically given up, you know, all of us have had pretty much given up. Uh, biologists were still really hoping for something. And then all of a sudden somebody shouts, vaquita, 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 you know? And, uh, you know, obviously I get, myself uh, up to the flybridge um, and to, to try to photograph this thing. And I can't see what they're talking about. So I just start, you know, basically spray and pray. I, they're saying, okay, it's about th in this area. And I'm just like clicking on my shutter, just going, Brrr, you know, hoping I get something. And thankfully I pull out this one image and, you know, everybody's ecstatic. Um, there, there was some video that a fellow a photographer got of, of the original ones, but the the biologists being able to see just this one image here were absolutely ecstatic. Uh, and they were so they were so happy that even this crummy little image uh you know proved that you know they did see a vaquita and that they are here um and uh and you know that they still need protecting. Um, so you know, I really hope it's not the last image of a vaquita ever. Um, I, I really hope that they come back as as, uh, as hard as it might, as hard as the efforts may be. Um, I'm super thankful that you know one of the most famous conservation photographers on Earth, Christina Minemeyer, is going to you know try to help them uh, soon, from what I'm being told. Uh, so, you know, there's always hope. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a real bummer when when a megafauna species like this, um, you know, goes and, you know, falls into extinction. Um, but uh, but, you know, there is always hope. And it's something that conservation photographers have to deal with on a daily basis. And and, uh, 
I want to let everybody know how important it is to be able to support, you know, your favorite ecosystem, your favorite animal, um, because uh, it, it's it's really necessary for the future of the human race so that we don't go extinct as well. Uh, but I don't want to end it on a sour note, you know, um, I'm just so thankful for everybody, you know, being here. Uh, thank you so much. And, um, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you, Joshua. That was amazing photography and great stories. So um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to for to ask, uh, I know Sheila asked, uh, what's next? Any projects that are on top of your bucket list? What next? Yeah. Um, so I just finished my article for Whalebone Magazine, um, and I will be submitting the same images to BBC Wildlife, you know, who has been thankfully interested in my work recently. Um, and I recently got invited to go to Panama to photograph um, uh, some birds and some research going on there. So I am looking for funding for that. I'm going to be asking the ILCP, uh, excuse me, the International League of Conservation Photographers, because they also just uh, recently sent two of my fellow photographers to the Bahamas and the marine protected areas to, you know, show how important our uh, marine ecosystems are, because, you know, marine ecosystems sustain all other ecosystems on earth. Um, so that is what I'm gonna be aiming for next. Um, but I'm also thinking about uh, my work with my, hopefully my next work with National Geographic because when the pandemic hit, uh, I was working on my first National Geographic story about condors. Uh, and so everything shut down. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be looking at National Geographic again, uh, seeing, seeing what's going on there. Um, and then uh, probably some more marine life stories out of Monterey Bay. Um, but yeah, so yeah, please check out my website. Um, you know, if anybody wants to help, you know, fund my research, uh, that'd be great. I'm, I'm also looking for, uh, excuse me, I'm looking for benefactors. You know, if you want to fund, you know, one story or multiple stories or something, um, you know, that'd be great. But I'm, I'm just thankful that you guys are here and, uh, you know, I hope you enjoyed everything. Agreed. Uh, Matthew asked if you have any books coming out soon, anything? <laughs> you know very well I have a book coming out soon, soon enough anyway, yeah. I've been working on uh, a book called A Family of Peregrines for a while. Um, I've been involved um, watching and, and tracking a, a family of peregrines near where I live. Um, and it's just so awesome to, to, to be able to see them. And what I mean is peregrine falcons. And so, um, you know, this is a species that Another huge success story that if you don't know, of course, the world's fastest uh, animal, you know, that can fly at speeds of 240 miles per hour. Um, and uh, so I don't want to necessarily focus on the conservation of, of the uh, peregrine falcons because they're, do, they're in a good place right now. But I really want to focus on the family dynamics of peregrine, peregrine falcons because as much as we uh, excuse me, as much as we value our family, you know, relationships and the way that we do things, animals, wolves, mountain lions, you know, peregrine falcons, uh, orcas, all kinds of animals have incredibly similar family dynamics to what we have. And I, I really want to be able to show people in this book uh, how similar we are to something as far away in the evolutionary chain as peregrine falcons and uh you know uh, so i'm looking forward to putting that out um in the next year or so i was going to put it out sooner but the peregrines are back and i you know i want to get some more really cool images of them uh and put those into the book um and uh, i got some special things planned for that book but i'm, I'm not going to talk about them right now thank you matt and unless anyone has any other questions at this point I think we are all set. Thank you, Joshua, for your time and uh, putting this together. I really appreciate you. And I appreciate everyone for being here and joining us today on this talk. 
And uh, I think, uh, any final words, Joshua? Yeah, just, you know, thank you so much again, guys. Um, if you, if you want to get in touch with me in the future, uh, you can check me out on Facebook or my Instagram um, or uh, just message me on my official site. Uh, anything, you know, uh, anything you, you want to talk about, I'm, I'm always interested in engaging um, whatever, whatever questions anybody has, for sure. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have a good rest of your weekend. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.